May the words from my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. Good morning. While I was in graduate school in the seminary, working on my Master of Divinity degree and preparing to become a priest, I had decided that I would reward myself with a special treat once I had successfully graduated. Now, of course, be assured, I was excited about being ordained. I was looking forward to celebrating my first Mass, to celebrating first baptisms, my first assignment as a parish priest. Rest assured, I was thinking of all of that, but I also had this one extra little goal. I wanted to learn to fly a plane. And so for those times when study sessions went long into the night, when my fingers became weary from typing yet another paper on that small typewriter, trying to make things correct with the correction tape, I would think about what it was like to be flying a plane. And after graduating, being ordained, and settled into the life of a new parish priest, I had the chance to pursue that goal of learning to fly. I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a former Air Force pilot who had all the necessary FAA certificates to serve as a flight instructor. Bill was his name. He loved sharing the gift of flying and teaching people how to fly, and he would accept students on occasion to shepherd them through the process of learning everything it would take to be ready to pass that crucial FAA check ride. The instructor pilot is the gateway to that check ride. You do not get to present yourself to the examiner until your student pilot logbook has been signed off that final time. And Bill did all this free of charge because it was his way of giving back to the community, of giving thanks for all of the blessings in his life, and it was his way of bringing new pilots into the fold. And over the many months he, of instruction, he would sit in the co-pilot seat next to me and calmly talk me through all of the flight maneuvers I needed to know and how to navigate by following the terrain and comparing it on a, on a map and what to do in various situations and most importantly, what to do in an emergency. And he would do this every time we flew together. There would be times when he would suddenly say, you've just lost your engine, where are we going to land? He would say, you've just lost this instrument, how will you compensate? And over time, we built that bond, that very close bond of mentor and student. And I grew to welcome and to place my trust in his insight and wisdoms. If Bill said it was to be, that was good enough. And when the final day of instruction arrived, he signed my student pilot's logbook for the last time, smiled at me, and told me I was ready to go take the exam and that I would do just fine. And I did take the exam and got my private pilot's license, and we both went on our separate paths again. And I enjoyed flying whenever I could, in the midst of my busy parish life and duties. And there was one day when shortly after takeoff, when I thought I was going to be enjoying a nice flight that afternoon, I quickly realized something was going very wrong with the plane and that I would probably be faced with what we referred to as an off-field forced landing and that it would be in a matter of minutes. And all I had ahead of me was a river. It was time for all of Bill's training and remembering the golden rules of aviate. The first thing you always have to do is fly the plane. It's not like a car where you can pull over to the side of the road and get out and take a look. Navigate. 
Our planes have to move forward to fly, so where are you going to go? And if you have the aviate and the navigate portion down and under control, then and only then do you communicate. Do you tell someone what is going on? I had a decision to make that morning. I had to make it soon. And only I could make the decision. No one was going to make it for me. The gospel passage this morning is actually part of a larger passage. It's our Lord instructing his disciples on how much he cares for his followers and how he is the true leader they have been promised by God. Jesus used the parable of a shepherd to teach them his role as the one who had been chosen to lead and care for the people of God. The problem was that his followers did not catch the meaning of the parable, even though they lived in a time and a place where such a parable should have made a lot of sense, perhaps even more so than for all of us gathered here today. In the time of this parable taught by Jesus, the sheepfold would probably have been a yard outside of a house, or perhaps a nearby meadow, where the sheep would have been housed for the night. The area would normally be enclosed by a low fence made of stone, and there would only be a single entrance, a gate to the enclosure. And since the fence was low, it would be easy for someone, a thief, to climb over and steal the sheep at night while no one was looking. A thief would not be able to go through the entrance, the gate, because there would have been someone, perhaps a hired hand, serving in the role of the gatekeeper, standing watch by the entrance. Only the shepherd had the right to enter the sheepfold unchallenged, unquestioned, for he was responsible for the sheep. Anyone else would expect to be challenged and refused entrance, for they would have no business being there unless directed by the shepherd unless the shepherd wanted them to enter the sheepfold to do the work he had sanctioned them to do, there would have been no reason for them to go among the sheep. Hence, a thief, knowing that the shepherd would not approve of the thief's presence, had to sneak into the sheepfold, trying to stealthily climb over the wall undetected and to steal the sheep back over that wall in the same manner and a hired hand, who has no real connection to the flock, would no doubt think only of himself and his safety and run away at the sight of a menacing wolf or of a pack of wolves. Since the disciples did not grasp the meaning of the parable, Jesus had to make it clear to them that he was talking about himself when he described the gate. Jesus also used another term in the Gospel account of John when he spoke of himself as the way to the Father in heaven. As the gate, Jesus is the only true passage for the people of God to the pasture of the kingdom of heaven. And only those who would minister to the flock who were sent by God would be permitted to teach and to work among the flock. Jesus was pointing out, no doubt, the Pharisees and those who falsely claimed to be the Messiah as the thieves and wolves to be kept out of the sheepfold and away from the sheep. They were not the right ones to claim effective leadership of the people and were not properly equipped to lead them to the pasture where they would be able to eat and drink to sustain their lives. Anyone who would follow them would be lost, while all who follow Jesus will have eternal life. And if we accept Jesus as the gate through which we will find our pasture, and we elect to follow his leadership, then we heard in the first letter from John this morning an admonishment to love others through truth and action to love one another as Jesus has commanded us. 
Jesus set the supreme example by praying for the forgiveness of the people who crucified him. He suffered abuse, humiliation, and death on a cross at the end of his public ministry as a result of his dedication to his heavenly Father and his love for his flock. He chose to accept the fate that awaited him and showed only compassion and love to those who tormented him. As the Good Shepherd, he chose to do everything necessary for the salvation and the well-being of his flock and for those individuals who will be added to the flock as time goes on. He is our gateway, our safe passage home, and we need to follow the examples he set for us regarding our treatment of others. Back in the plane that afternoon, once I had assessed the situation, I had gone through all of the quick checks and things that we were taught to do when we learned to fly and had made my decision of what to do. I made a radio call to the control tower to tell them my, dis my situation and the decision I had made. And there was no discussion, no point in counterpoint. It was my decision. I had to make it. And the controllers on the tower told me that I was cleared to do whatever I needed to do. And I had realized that even though there was a problem with the plane, I had just enough altitude and airspeed that I could safely abort to the crosswind runway at the airport. And so I started to execute my plan of action. And the moment I started, I felt a sense of quiet and of confidence. I had been trained repeatedly to handle a situation just like this. And as I carried out each step, it was as if as I could hear the voice of my instructor pilot talking me through the setup and the landing. It was as if Bill was sitting there next to me in the cockpit again, calmly walking me through everything until I had taxied the plane to the ramp and shut the engine down. Later that evening, I called my father, who is also a former Air Force pilot himself, and described what had happened and how strange it seemed that I could hear Bill's voice talking me through every step. In fact, I had even at one point turned to look to see, is he in the plane with me or not? I could just remember everything I was being taught. And my father said he had had a similar experience during his flying career. And we agreed that it is sign of more than just a great instructor pilot. It's more like a personal shepherd to the sky, someone who truly cares for the student pilot and does everything they can for them to help them to be safe. What I had experienced while returning safely to the ground was the effectiveness of Bill's training to me, constantly going over the procedures, describing what to do, building that muscle memory that created the effect of seeming like he was sitting right there with me in the cockpit that afternoon. But he wasn't. What the disciples experienced after the resurrection of Jesus was not mere muscle memory playing back during their encounters. It was not just remembering what he had said. They had, in fact, experienced the true risen Lord. Mary Magdalene had been the first person to be in the presence of the risen Lord and had spoken to him. And she recognized him as soon as she heard him say her name. Just the one word from him was all she needed. She heard her shepherd's voice, and she knew it was truly him. On the road to Emmaus that evening, the two disciples had walked and talked with Jesus while not recognizing him, and then said to themselves after recognizing him and the breaking of the bread at their meal, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? 
Jesus appeared twice to the disciples locked in the upper room and gave them examples to prove it was really him and assured them that they need not be afraid. And a third time he appeared to them on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias and invited them to come ashore and to eat the meal he had prepared for them. He was still present to them, still caring for them, and the same is true for us today. Jesus assured us that when two or three are gathered in his name, he is there among them. And I see many more than just two or three gathered here this morning. He is here with us today. He is here with us every day. Our shepherd still cares for us, is still present to us, and watches over us always. We just need to listen to his voice and follow in his way. Amen.